What's up, guys? Welcome to our first uh, interview for Nuance and Nonsense. I heard Chris Heaney, my good friend from college, and, uh, and you know Shaney, of course. Um, Shaney Alexis. And so <laughs> we're going to cover a couple of things with Chris. We'll see, uh, we'll see where it goes. And uh, yeah, let's get into it. So we're going to start out with some icebreakers. <laughs> um, just say kind of the first thing that comes to mind. Um, favorite hardware or software that's not like super common. So not like an iPhone. Like that we, that we might not know of or like. Uh, right like now. an app you really like or just anything that comes to mind. Yeah, Ethereum blockchain. Ethereum. <laughs> there we go. We told you. We'll get so uh, he's too smart for me to know what's going on. <laughs> Um, we'll go into that later. Um, what's your favorite song of all time? Um, probably let's go with Gorgeous by Kanye West off my oh, good dark t- twisted fantasy, whatever that one's I called. Res- I respect that choice. I <laughs> really like Kanye's, is it called Runaway? Yeah, that's like the same album. Yeah. I love that song. Yeah. Um, we will have to listen to that later on the way to dinner. Um, your workout food routine, if you have one. Okay. Um, typical try- meal, typical workout. Yeah. So we'll try to do like intermittent fasting and skip breakfast and then uh, lift, like, you know, normal lift, like bench or pull ups or squats or something. And then. Is there, yeah. is there a gym in this house? I got a 75 pound dumbbell in, nice. the, in the garage. <laughs> And a little pull up, like you know, like the pull up bar that you hang yeah. on the door, and then <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's the it's the minimal viable you're gym. You're doing something, dude. <laughs> the, the MVG minimal viable gym. So I've been calling it. Uh, and then I eat like turkey, spinach, and eggs. My go to for nice. lunch or right after that, yeah. Um, <laughs> you see the similarities already. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you guys have a lot in common. Um, typical thing that you wear on a casual day and then also on a more dressed up day? Um, I don't really have dressed up days because I'm a <laughs> software engineer in quarantine. So every day is pretty much like sweat shorts and like a tank top for me. Nice. <laughs> um, <laughs> This one's kind of random, but who's your celebrity crush? If you could be with any celebrity, who would it be? Who's... Who? <laughs> mm. <laughs> mm. Uh. Megan Fox. <laughs> Megan Fox. Megan Fox. Jennifer no Aniston. Um, uh. Angelina Jolie. Courtney Kardashian. Who really, <laughs> who really tickles your <laughs> your kisser? <laughs> oh man, um, I can't even think of anyone right now. Um, let's go with that. let's go with uh, Ari Lennox, my sister's favorite rapper. And I don't even know. I know. She's, I, on, I, I, I know she's on Spillage right. Village, and they just came out with the album, so the name just popped into my head. <laughs> Is she a poetry rapper? Uh, I guess kind of, yeah. She's, she's not the one that dissed. Um, what's it? J name? Cole. No, that's no name. Okay. No name. I don't think no name would be into me. <laughs> <laughs> um, Ari Lennox either, but. <laughs> <laughs> what is your favorite like? self-improvement mm. or philosophy book that you've read? Ooh. Um, da, mm. da, 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 da. He's read, <laughs> he's, he reads a lot, so. Uh, <laughs> damn. Hmm. That's a good question. Um, but something that's not off immediately obvious that I liked. Um, it could be obvious because these people don't know you. Or maybe like, <laughs> yeah. not even, it doesn't have to be something or like, like a philosophy, just like a like a, an idea that was helpful to you. Hmm. This question's hard for me because I haven't read any books since I'm junior high. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I 
You know, I'm reading, I'm listening to The Ascent of Money right now. It's by this uh, Neil Ferguson, this British guy, and it's just going through the history of money. Um, and I think it's interesting to hear about like the history and evolution of money and it makes some things like kind of make more sense. So like, you know, where do bonds come from? When did the stock market start? Um, so kind of having a conceptual grounding of what money is, I think is What's good. What's that one book that you read that's about the Federal Reserve? The, oh, what's it called? The Monster of uh, Jekyll Island or something. Have you read uh, that? The Creature on Jekyll Island. It's about like how the Federal Reserve was formed. Oh, I, I, I didn't even finish it. Because you, he like, it's all he talked about for weeks <laughs> when he was reading it. Yeah. So I feel like you would like that too if you like. I think I talked to you about that. Yeah, you brought you, it up. You, you know, he knows about that. What is it, the ascent, like A-S-C-E-N-T? Yeah, like the ascent of money. So those were all my pop questions. So that segment's over. You're off the hot seat. Yeah. <laughs> cool, cool. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, can you just, can you tell, because obviously I know some of this story, can but uh, Shaney doesn't. Can you say what he does Let, Let's first, start. give him a title, because people don't know, like. Yeah, so so what do, you, what do you do for work? I'm a software engineer and I work on Alexa. Um, yeah. For Amazon, yeah. And um, let's start with because I think it's I think you're a pretty interesting guy. <laughs> and um, so, can you just give like a brief walkthrough of like okay, growing up, you're obviously this is the house you were born and raised in, right? Mm -hmm. Wrigleyville. Kind of like what it was like growing up here and getting into college, and then how'd you get into being a software engineer? <laughs> Okay. Um, what were you into as a kid, kind of? What was that, that like? Yeah. yeah, so growing up, I played, like my main thing was I played a lot of basketball. Um, like that was my main hobby. Uh, and then I ended up playing for like the JV team at Wash U. Um, I went to a public school um, called Lincoln Park. And Lake Park was cool because it was like pretty diverse background. Um, it wasn't like all one economic class or you know one race. So that is was a lot a of diversity. Is a question? But is that what the like the band? band? No, oh. it's not what it's <laughs> that is a common question. Oh, nice. um, so yeah, I guess just grow up like pretty serious student athlete. My favorite uh, subject was was math. Um, but then yeah, I went to Wash U, studied. Uh, business um, for got my yeah study business and then after my junior year got an internship in consulting and then really hated consulting <laughs> so then kind of decided I needed to figure out uh, something different to do and, uh, and business consulting is where you go in and try to help businesses like pretty much restructure to make more money yeah. and like just run a better business right yeah exactly so you go into a company they have a problem and that they can't figure out uh, for themselves so then you kind of come up with a proposal um, so a lot of people do that right out of school it's kind of like a common career path yeah well actually a lot of people go that route right now yeah. yeah so it's kind of like um it's almost like going in investment banking or going to law school. It's kind of like well trotting ground. So I tried that out because I was in a business school and everyone else was doing it around me. So I was just kind of like, all right, that's what I got to do. Um, and I really didn't like it. And so um, wanted to figure out something else to do. And I had friends that were into computer science. So and but you have that homie here too, right? You have your friend here, yeah. yeah. What did you not like about it? I'm gonna interrupt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just have you. Um, Expand. Well, being consultant, you have to be like a lot of it is like um, I'm. Well, there's like the straw man and like of the critique, but that it's pretty much like a lot of sales um, and like relationship building, and so it's. And this is like you know the people that will defend that this isn't the case, but um, in the worst case, you're basically just telling your client what they want to hear. So a company has an issue, say two people in the company are disagreeing on what should be done. 
one of them hires the consulting firm and you come in there and basically mm -hmm. support what they want to hear and then they can argue to the person they're arguing against like look at the consultants told me this I so. was literally <laughs> thinking like it would be really um, I guess what's the word I'm looking at like thinking of um, intimidating to come right out of college and then you go into a business with like these higher ups that have been working the job for 20 years know the business better than a college student. To me, that would be really like intimidating to come in and be like, yeah, I'm a young college kid that really has no actual years of work experience well, yeah, they, or your company. And then but, they bill you at like $100 an hour for yeah. your work and you're like an in intern basically. And so, and yeah. I mean, even if you are really good at knowing what you, what you do, you're kind of walking on, it seems like you would have to be walking on like eggshells around people because like they it's hard to make changes in companies even if you work at the company so I can't imagine like coming in and just like being like well this all needs to be changed you know? yeah. yeah I mean I think it's common in business you see in certain situations whether it's some type of consulting or not like people spending more effort on the appearance of work than the work yeah like they want to have work to show for it you know or have some work to show, but they care more about the showing part than actual work. I mean, I see that in what I do too. I mean, to me, it's really interesting that you hooped and then now you're like a software engineer, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Like I feel like you've walked these different paths that don't overlap much. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I think you're um, so nuanced. Like the uh, name of the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> the perfect guest. <laughs> <laughs> What is it? Nuance and nuance and nonsense. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, um, so you got so okay. So, so you, after your jun your junior summer, you took the internship and got kind of disenchanted with it. Yeah. And was it your fall of your senior year where you started studying? Yeah. I will caveat really quickly that I have friends in consulting, and there's a strong case that <laughs> the consulting comes in and like basically connects information across a big organization and like does get valuable insight and I think that can be true yeah but even in that case it's like you're giving advice and then you kind of walk away so there's no you don't close the feedback loop you don't implement what you're doing and so that was also kind of unappealing like I wanted to eventually be like building companies because I thought that sounded interesting and consulting doesn't prepare you for that because there's no closing of the loop of your analysis so there's a strong and like a weak argument against consulting it could be better yeah. for someone who's more of a big picture person yeah you know than someone that's like an implement person like mm -hmm. you seem like you like to like do the dirty work almost so with, like go, yeah <laughs> yeah i, I mean know, to be an engineer to... like you have to kind of almost it has to like bother you to not know how things work mm -hmm. um and so as a consultant like you can kind of just get by, give your analysis in, and there's no, yeah. I think I would like that because I'm like the type of person that's like, I just want to tell you everything you're doing wrong, mm -hmm. but I don't want to have to do it. Yeah. Like, I don't want to deal with that shit, yeah. but I wish yeah. I was more like you and actually like wanted to deal with the shit. <laughs> yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't, yeah. Um, I do think after working, I'm working at Amazon now in a bigger company, I think I see more of the value in consulting, mostly like in big companies, you get your hierarchy and like you don't necessarily get communication across like the sub components and so then a consultant comes in and they might actually be able to see something that the people yeah, in the hierarchy yeah. don't see so mm -hmm. I've, i'm honestly more bullish on consulting now than i was before <laughs> but i still didn't like it um, yeah so uh that's, that's yeah. kind of cool though you know it's always nuanced yeah. like it's it's rarely like Consulting's bad or it's perfect, you know. Yeah, I want to be cool and bash on them, but you, they got yeah. something there. <laughs> yeah. You just didn't personally just, like like doing it yourself. Yeah, and I yeah. also like I, I mean, I was like 21 and didn't like having to wear a suit every day, and thought it was cool that people in tech like seemed more like it seemed less um, based on how you presented yourself and more almost meritocratic in the sense of like if you can yeah. write good code then that's all that matters so that appealed to me too it's very true um but yeah then senior year i came back didn't really know what i wanted to do started having like existential angst and um but yeah started learning to code 
took a bunch of CS classes my senior year. Were you taking like 20 something credits or something? Like yeah, that? I maxed out on the course load because I wanted to take as many CS and classes. You got a minor? Yeah, I got a yeah. minor in CS. And then um, got a job at a startup in Santa Barbara called Graphic. Um, and started working there as like a product manager kind of role. Um, and then just kept like kind of learning to code on the side and in the job. And then after a year, I moved over to software engineer. And then uh, we were acquired by Amazon. And so then I started being, I was a software engineer at Amazon for the last three years. And um, so, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. And um, so like I was saying before, like, like you've walked these different paths that, that, uh, that don't overlap like yeah and what do you think is a trait that allows you to adapt to different walks of life like that you know what i mean mm -hmm. what what do you think you've learned to doing that and what allows you to do that yeah i think um i think there's actually a lot of similarities i mean between basketball and software engineering and the at the more like abstract level so uh for me, like I really like discipline and like having like a routine and like working at something. And so when I was growing up, that was basketball. Like I practice every day. You go out there, like you practice shooting. If it goes in, you know, you keep shooting that way. If you miss, you kind of alter your your, right. your technique. And so there's just like just this whole like breaking code or something. <laughs> and yeah. Where and so when I started coding. I kind of fell into that same routine where it's like, okay, I'm trying to get better at a skill. Like try something out. Does it work? Does it not work? Oh, if it does work, stick with it. If it doesn't, pivot. And so it's kind of the same. Just like. Um, just just focus on like wanting to be good at something. Yeah. Um, and there's definitely like people involved are a lot di different, right? Um, in software engineering and basketball, but it's still very team based. So, you know, being able to be friendly and like get along with people helps in both. So it's interesting because seemingly way different things involve like these kind of more intangible things that are very similar. Um, yeah, yeah, you're like remembering plays in basketball and then in software, you're remembering code. Yeah. <laughs> They're yeah. like languages well, yeah. of, I could never remember back That's really interesting. Place. I got yelled at. Because I, like, I feel like what you're saying too about just that ability to like pivot, like that's what even, <laughs> that's what even I think allowed you to, like a lot of people would, would like, would Maybe. fall into like the sunk cost of like, oh, I studied business for three years and I got a good internship. And it's like, uh, I've done so much, like I'm gonna go here, but like, I always was impressed with, with how your senior year where most people are like, okay, I'm gonna get my job and then kind of slack off. It's like, you were like, no, I'm gonna completely do something new, learn like a skill and coding is hard. I mean, <laughs> you yeah. know, it's like a hard, like it's not like, oh, I'm gonna learn, I don't know how to, I don't know. I don't know what's easy <laughs> to learn, honestly. It's worth it. I guess nothing's easy, but advice. yeah, but. <laughs> I just well, I feel like that same mentality, right? I mean, I don't know. Yeah, I think there's also even similarities between business and um, uh, business and software. Like they're they're both well, at least how they taught business at WashU. You know, you learned about statistics and um, you learn about supply chains and operations. And supply chains and operations are about like breaking down the production of a uh, of some good into steps. And then you try to optimize the different steps. So you learn about things like throughput and capacity of each step. And then when you learn about coding, like those same words come up, right? Capacity, throughput, optimization, like these things, like it's almost like you're kind of learning uh, systems engineering and business and computer software. So like systems engineering is up here and then uh, business and, and uh, software engineering are just like instantiations of that. And you don't realize yeah. you're learning something more generic, but you really are. Yeah. And so like being able to find the patterns there and be like, oh, I actually already know this. And like when I was in school, they taught it one way, but if you just kind of tweak um, the words, then they're actually talking about the same thing. Um, yeah. yeah. So I don't think it was quite as like big a jump as it maybe seems if you uh, just think about them being like different majors, but right. Uh, yeah, right. So if you, um, since you worked on Alexa, do you have Alexa stuff like all over your house and like, oh wait, like, do you like yeah, do you use it? lights on? Are you like a big, um, <coughs> tech 
what do you call it? Like Sam wants his whole house tech someday. Do you have I that at all? I go back and forth on it, but I know some guys who do that. Um, I don't have uh, Alexa here. I had it back in Santa Barbara. Um, I'm honestly not super tech forward and like having and like as much tech as possible. Yeah. Um, I'm more just like. Do you do the Apple Watch? I do do the Apple Watch. Yeah. But um, I don't have. I don't really have the killer use case for uh, Alexa in my life, so I don't use it a ton. But I use it all the time at work, so, you know. When you, so, like, I, and I know you're working on some crypto stuff kind of in your free time. Yeah. And so, is it, am I right in saying, like, that since you're doing for your nine to five, you're coding, and then you're also having these, these side projects, am I right in saying that, like, when you're not doing those things, you kind of just like, oh, I kind of want to step back and like rip some pull-ups or just kind of unplug a little bit do you do you yeah I, I agree with that like, that's how I feel because I'm I do social media for my job yeah so like I'm always connected all day so when I'm not at work like I it's a struggle to want to do social media because it's like I have to do this all day you know mm -hmm. yeah um I I'd agree with that uh I just like to unplug, I guess. Yeah. And so, um, you've explained it to me a little bit, and but I, I think it's helpful that Shaney's here because she, she can kind of come from like a beginner mind. Can you kind of like <laughs> outline, like I said, you're explaining to a five-year-old. What, no, like for, <laughs> like right for our audience. I'm a five-year-old? No, there's a thing on Reddit like that. Anyways, I'm like, I'm I'm five, like a five. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not saying for you. <laughs> For me, like, I, it's really hard for me to That's understand. That's Michael Scott the other day. Yeah. He was on, he was like, can you explain this? Like, I'm seven, and then he goes, uh, can it's you explain really like, like, five? Yeah. Um, but what what are you working on with Ethereum? Mm -hmm. um, that you can say. Can you say? What uh, it's are? not for my job. Oh, it's yeah. Ethereum like a side project. Crypto, crypto stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah, so there's, uh, don't start. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, I guess Ethereum is like, you could just think of it as a distributed computer. So like when you have your laptop, you have one computer that's executing. Um, and really what Ethereum is, instead of one, you have like N computers. So, you know, we have like this guy and this guy, and they're all executing the same code. And then when they execute, they check that they all got the same result. Um, so like this guy did two plus two equals four. We checked that all the computers have two plus two equals four. That's like the decentralized part of it. Right, exactly. Day five. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so Ethereum is just like a, just almost, yeah, distributed computer is a, a solid way to put it for like a five-year-old. And or I guess I wouldn't know what <laughs> distributed means, but uh, basically you have the same code running on a bunch of computers. Then on top of that, there's um, this thing called decentralized finance, which is DeFi. Um, and so they're trying to build like financial applications on top of this like distributed computer. Um, and one of the things they're doing is called uh, basically decentralized lending protocols. So you have three parties of people here. You have one person who's basically uh, lending out money in Ethereum. You have another person that is uh, borrowing in Ethereum. And then there's this third group of people called liquidators that basically make sure that the borrowers don't have too much, haven't borrowed too much. So um, when someone borrows too much, the liquidator comes in, pays off part of the debt and gets uh, the borrower's collateral. So when a borrower, I didn't say this, when the borrower goes to borrow, uh, they'll get say like $100 of A and they have to be over collateralized, which means they have to put up like $150 of B. So now they have 100, they've taken out 100 of A and put 150 B in. But if the price of A moves up against B, now they have, they're borrowing too much A. So it's a jeopardy to the system. Mm -hmm. So the liquidator comes in and like basically says, you're borrowing too much and I'm gonna pay that down and take some of the collateral for myself. And so it's kind of this like ecosystem of uh, different parties are all trying to get different things out of the system. And we're trying to build like a liquidator bot that basically watches the ecosystem. And if someone borrows too much, we, we like step in and pay off their debts and, and take some is, of their collateral. This is for a specific kind of cryptocurrency? 
Yeah, so, so it's just So Bitcoin doesn't do any of what you just explained? Like, yeah. Or do they have their is own it, way of doing it, that? Ethereum is like a, it's a cur- currency and a protocol, right? Like yeah. A, am I right in saying that? Uh, yeah. Uh, or, I mean... Or, that's, or is that Bitcoin? I don't know. <laughs> all of them are protocols. Right. Um, so what's per- the big difference between Bitcoin and this other one? And why would Ethereum be better than Bitcoin? Um, or yeah. It, like so maybe it's not better, but why different. would you think They're, it would be? So um, Bitcoin is really just designed to be a uh, store of value. Like it's a currency um, where Ethereum is more trying to be like a new almost type of computer. So Ethereum, like each node in the Ethereum network is actually executing code, like generalized code. Like you can write um, in like CS, they're like, it's like Turing complete, which just means you can do anything you can tell a normal computer to do, you can theoretically do on an Ethereum node. Where for Bitcoin, like that, you can't do that. It's just, um, it's, it's just way funny. simpler. Is with Bit- the Bitcoin network, it's just verifying the blocks, basically. Yeah, Bitcoin is like you just are saying person A gets money from person B, person B gives it to C. And yeah. so it doesn't have the full like expressivity of uh, Ethereum. But that's okay. that's not necessarily a bad thing. It, it makes Bitcoin more secure. Um, and like uh, basically by Ethereum being so, uh, being able to like execute any type of code, uh, it's more complex and um, it's not as secure as Bitcoin, so they're they're kind of they're different. They're different. And Ethereum is built on a blockchain, yeah. As well, okay. Um, and so, wow, man, <laughs> it's so mind blowing, dude. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's pretty cool. Um, so you guys are trying to create a liquidator bot. Mm-hmm. But it's cool because so uh, this kind of the decentralized lending protocol. Usually, you have um, in normal finance, you have an institution that basically lends out, lends to borrowers, and then those borrowers do short trades, and then the lender is the liquidator in, in a centralized institution. Mm-hmm. Um, but in this right. case, okay. we're like, we're bringing three different parties into it, and so it's, um, it's Decentral- cool. Yeah. Right, because like, I think what's important to explain to like people who don't understand it, maybe like, like just central, if you could just kind of, br- like we're talking about decentralized, right? Like so, centralized would be like a bank. Yeah. Like Bank of America, so, like they are just they're saying this this is the, these are the transactions, and you have to kind of trust us more or less, right? Mm-hmm. And so, do you, do you get that? Like, so this would just be cutting out the banks. Is that? It's like everybody's like he said. It's like so. There a node is like a server or computer, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's like if you think about it, like thousands and thousands of people with their own computers are verifying the the transactions this is the same with bitcoin as well whereas like before like my my bank would be verifying the transactions and that's it maybe the fdic or something but it's like do you do you, do you, do you see how do there's a problem with that like, mess up a lot? uh yeah so like there's the like there's so many canonical examples but like uh, wells fargo like was just making fake accounts under people's names um, to like boost their stats that happened in the last couple of years. Yeah. Yeah, um, I mean, there's, there's normal like commercial banks and then there's the federal reserve. And so right now the federal reserve basically increases the money supply like to combat COVID. But what that does, it means like the dollars in everyone's pocket are like worth decrease in value. So a big, like Bitcoin popped up in like 2000 and I think nine or eight, right, 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 yeah, right around the financial crisis. So, um, and a big part of it is like fear of how like central banks can inflate away money. Yeah. Um, and so usually a centralized solution is good and there's not that much risk there. It's in like the, the edge case where they do like miss like abuse their power. That's when you wish you had a decentralized solution where like no one has that much power to like kind of screw everyone else. Right. Over. Right. So people are really excited about Bitcoin right now because like the Fed is basically inflating or yeah. they're adding so much money. I guess inflation isn't here yet, but people are saying it's gonna be here. Right, right. And yeah, and that's like the what you're saying, the book that I read, it talks about, this book was written in like the 90s or something, it's before Bitcoin, but basically I guess what we're seeing, if tell me if I'm wrong, is like now we have the, the 
technolo- technological capabilities to have a decentralized system that works, right? right? And it's decentralized currency, like, cause with Bitcoin too, it's, it's the thing with Bitcoin is right. Is like, you can make these anonymous transactions like instantly for a super low cost mm-hmm. and no one like, or everyone can see the data, but it's, but it's still anonymous. Like you don't necessarily know who's who, right? Yeah. There's, right. there's ways that they can kind of, uh, trace, uh, with their IP address, I guess would be, or cool. like, you have an address in Bitcoin and like you do transactions and they can kind of like start to infer who you are from those, ad- like who the, what the address is and the who the addresses are spending to each other. Right. So once you find out who maybe like what, what one address, what person that is, and you see who other uh, people are interacting with the address, they like can figure that out. So one critique of Bitcoin is actually not anonymous enough. And so oh. there's like then additions to Bitcoin, like there's this thing called Zcash where it's like, you can't track from one address to the like one transaction to the next who people are and like so there's is it like a more uh, privacy there like a proxy almost for bitcoin wallets um <laughs> or what's yeah. it called like a vpn like where it's almost i honestly never have looked into zcash how it works but i think that. that's uh yeah roughly how it works and so okay or not, no, a lot I of think people about are it. worried now about. that like no one's using cash anymore because <laughs> Like they're really pushing like everyone to use a car because of the virus. That like people are just worried about you know people having our digital number of what we like right. have in our bank account. You know. Well, like yeah, yeah. And so Bitcoin. That's so Bitcoin. One of the critiques is that it's not anonymous enough, but it's still much more anonymous than like my Charles Schwab account, right? Yeah, because Charles Schwab is just like, oh, we have this guy's address, social security number, where he lives, every transaction he's made. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, and that's and that's like written into law. Like, there's a like know your customer uh, law. I don't know the exact what the exact law is, oh, but the government yeah. basically forces banks to know like everything about the customer and all how all the customers are interacting, so that they can flag like any suspicious activity. Right, like, that popped up. I think after like 9-11, they said, you know, terrorists are using the banks to fund each other. And so we want to know every transaction coming through the bank. And so they know like your email, your phone number, where you live and who you're transacting with. Um, and so one, one other thing that like people talk about Bitcoin is, you know, you don't need like, uh, you don't need all this, uh, you don't need an address or an email to use Bitcoin. Like, but to use banks, like you do need that. So in other countries where people don't have those forms of ID, those people are unbanked. Because the banks say like, we right. have this regulation that we need to fulfill or we're not gonna do business with you. And so like people in uh, poor countries don't have essentially the identity necessary to use the banking industry. So okay. yeah, like, I mean, people who are like Bitcoin maximalists are like, we're gonna like serve the unbanked, which yeah. Well, and cool. then it's and it's like in some countries, right? Like I know in Venezuela, like there's like the, the, I don't know about now, but in recent history, there's been like such hyperinflation, right? Right. Where it's like people, like imagine if imagine if you and I were married, retired, and it's like we had two million dollars in the bank, and it's like within three months, it's worth a hundred grand or something. Like that's that shit was happening to people more right. or less, and so. It's, it's like people in the US, I feel like don't see it as well. Cause we're like, like we think of the money we have in dollars as being pretty safe. But right. in other countries, like your life savings could just suddenly be worth a yeah. third of what it is, you know. That's that, scary. That's, that's the main benefit of Bitcoin is it's, it's basically code that's run by a distributed network of nodes and the code can't change. So the code says there's only going to be 21 million Bitcoins in supply ever. Right. And so there's no way anyone can come in and change the number of Bitcoins. And so it's, it's not inflationary. And that's why people like, like it. It's like, okay, every node's guaranteed to run the same thing. And because of like economic incentives, like they won't stop. They won't. Uh, stop running it so we can just basically bank on there being 21 bitcoins forever yeah. and so that's why now everyone's like alright even though bitcoin's super volatile it's like an inflation hedge yeah because and would am I wrong in saying that like 
the price of Bitcoin is volatile because the world's volatile, but Bitcoin is actually super stable, right? Like our interpretation of what the value is is what's really volatile. Yeah, the money, but the, the money supply is like stable, completely steady, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, there's a formula that predicts like there's not actually 21 million bitcoins yet. Right, it, they're still adding new ones, but like the formula for its supply and minting is well defined and it won't change, so that's stable. Like remember, Shane, I was telling you, I was like, oh, we gotta buy some because it's about to have mm -hmm. the happening. They call it where it's what's like the rate of, that they're. Mind. Okay. Yeah. So, do you personally buy out. Bitcoin? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And do you also do you invest like on Robinhood or anything? Are you into that? Uh, yeah, I don't use Robinhood, but yeah, I've been investing. I, yeah, you honestly, just, since COVID, I've gotten way more into investing. You don't use an app at all. I just use my Chase account to buy like stocks and stuff. So I'm definitely very freaked out about the whole inflation. Um. Yeah. with uh, COVID, and so, do you that's have, also why I'm really into Do you have any gold bars? Do you buy any gold bars? <laughs> I don't have any physical gold bars, which I know you're supposed to, but I do own like uh, ETFs that track gold. Um, I'm not so bearish on the world that like, I think I'll need physical gold. <laughs> <laughs> but I do, I do think gold. Yeah, I do. Own gold I think it'd be kind of cool though to have in your house as like decor. It's, yeah, like a <laughs> yeah. It's been such a weird year, like, because like I hear a lot of people going like, oh, well, the economy's doing great, you know, because they just see on the news like, oh, the, you know, the S and P five hundred went up three points this week or whatever, yeah. and it's like, I don't know that much about it, but to me, it seems like it's kind of like propped up on this like shaky thing that the Federal Reserve is basically printing money to to bail out these banks more or less because they're lending too much money, right? It, it's just, I don't know. I yeah. got more into, um, I'm not really super knowledgeable about stocks and stuff, but during quarantine, like when stocks started to go down, I bought some like really risky stocks, like like Carnival and like- and Like um, Boeing you bought and they all, yeah. like, they were good buys, right? I mean- um, They were, they went all went up and then I mean, I still haven't lost any money yet. Like, they're up like 60. Yeah. I, I made like $60 so far, but. Nice. Yeah. That's good though. Do you, do you uh, with your investing, do you like try to like make any like risky plays or are you just more like a slow and steady, like wait out the market kind of guy? Which is what everybody tells you to do, I mean. Uh, yeah, I'm not that risk. Well, I guess it you depends. I mean, crypto, that, some people would say crypto yeah, is so, risky. Yeah, some people think yeah. crypto is super risky. So I think relative to, a lot of people, I own a lot of crypto. It was like a percentage of the money of my like wealth is in crypto. So yeah. we'll see, like that could go to zero, but I'm just like a believer. So I don't think it will. Yeah. Um, otherwise I'm, I'm pretty risk averse. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's a good point. It's about perspective. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you're making me want to buy Bitcoin again. <laughs> I had a random question for you. Do you like Santa Barbara or Chicago better because you grew up in Chicago and now you live in Santa Barbara. Mm -hmm. What's what do you like about both and what you don't like? Um, I like Santa Barbara is um, just like so much nature and uh, like you're in between the ocean and mountains and it's great weather um, and so that's just like it's great place to be like healthy and <laughs> like just post up. So I really like that. I mean, Chicago's like a city and has way more energy. And I grew up here and like more diverse. I mean, there's no diversity in Santa Barbara. And I guess, yeah, there's not as much diversity there and there's less going on. Um, Santa Barbara was great after school. Like I was learning to code and like there's really not that much to do in Santa Barbara, like relative to a city. So it was like a good place to focus and yeah. like, kind of get my stuff together. But I mean, I think I like most about Santa Barbara is just like going on hikes and like, yeah, just hanging out at coffee shops, like the premier place to do that. Yeah. Um, what do I like more? I don't know if I can answer. Santa Barbara is definitely up there with Chicago now in mm -hmm. my mind, but they're way different. Yeah, Chicago is like home, but Santa Barbara is like where, like where you're loving right now, I guess. Yeah, and yeah. Like Santa Barbara's, now I almost feel nostalgic, like towards Santa Barbara. It's like, oh, I had these like times there where like I learned a lot and grew. And then I feel like COVID hit and now like, 
I'll never have that period of time again. So I'm already like nostalgic about Santa Barbara. And um, where, uh, so are, aren't you, did you get your master's or you're studying at your master's, right? Yeah, I'm doing part-time school. Okay. And, um, you know, so you've been working at, you been, well, you're working at Graphic, but acquired by Amazon and you've been there a few years. Like what's kind of like How do you have the long-term, you, you know, cause, cause I just know that you- <laughs> Don't you, have a girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get any ideas. <laughs> Uh, what, what, where do you, where do you like, what are you working towards? Is there any specific thing where you're like, oh, I want to start my own software company one day, or I want to, you know, I want to make a living off of blockchain consulting or I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Do you have, do you have like a goal like that in mind or are you just at a point where you're just like, man, I, I'm interested in these things and I think I want to learn about them or. Yeah. I don't have like a definitive plan and I'm not like. I feel like I change my mind on things like every day. So I don't know. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm studying um, math part-time. So taking like uh, math classes. And I just think math is kind of like the language that engineering is baked in. So I just want to get as strong a foundation in math just as, so I can like be as good an engineer as possible in like whatever direction that takes me. So that's kind of like a you know, trying to like level up my skills. And I think, yeah. I mean, I think math is just like, uh, it's kind of like the language that like nature, like that we used to describe nature. And so it's like really, yeah, it's uh, really interesting to me to study. But then like, so sometimes I'm like, oh, I want to just focus more on like school and like learning about like, you know, uh, kind of just math and different types of engineering. And then other time I'm like, Oh, crypto is taking over the world. Like I need to go to work for a crypto startup. Like this is the, the future. Yeah. And so it goes back and forth every day. And sometimes I'm like, oh, I should just like keep working at Amazon and definitely. And it's like, you know, yeah. so yeah. it's just like a cycle, but <laughs> um, yeah, just trying to take it, I guess, day by day. Yeah. Um, Cause I, it seems like, I don't know you compared to other people I know who like are maybe I would say like ambitious, with, with their time and projects and stuff. Like it's for you, it's always just seemed like, like kind of like natural. Like you're not like trying to be the crypto guy or trying to be a math fucking wizard, you know? But it's well, like- I'm trying. <laughs> but it's like, you, know, but you just like, you just are. Like you just, you just like doing it and are just like, it's not about like the result as much it seems like as just like the process. You enjoy yeah, the know. process. Yeah, I, me looks, looks yeah. Like <laughs> I know that's like corny, but I it is corny, know. but I think uh, the, I like this guy Naval on Twitter, the dude, sorry, Angelus, and oh, yeah. we talk about him, but he talks about how like, you want to do something where it looks like work to other people, but it's really play for you. <laughs> and like, as much as I can, I try to organize like my life so that I'm doing things I'm interested in. So yeah, um, that's that awesome. Dad, and not ideally like you're interested in things that you can, you know, make a living doing. Like luckily I like like math and engineering stuff. So like that's fortunate, but. What about um, me? It's, I want to be a YouTuber and it looks like play to everybody, but it feels like work. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've got the opposite thing going on. <laughs> that's good. Uh, that's good. <laughs> I didn't even think of that. <laughs> um, our reservations at four. So we yeah, so we gotta wrap up. That's a that was good. It's it. it like a joke to end on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Right. Play, but Thanks it's work. so much. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much for doing this. I know yeah. that like you've probably never done a podcast before. So, yeah. and I know we don't have a lot of viewers, so it's not like you're getting a bunch of clout. But thank you for being a a player. I guess a good. Yeah. I didn't say anything that could get me fired. So <laughs> <laughs> that's a win. <laughs> Yeah, me neither. I told my boss I was going to be on the, on the podcast, and he was like, send it to me. And I was like, well, I don't say anything stupid. <laughs> I love Wells Fargo, for the record. <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks for watching. <laughs> Have a great day. See you guys later. Bye.